cancer back when I was 16 in 2012, um, which is nine years ago now. I feel like it's flown by, really. Um, but yeah, my first um, pain, well, I first felt a pain in my knee. I didn't realise what it was. Um, I lived with that for about three months. Um, I went to the doctors and they sent me away with painkillers thinking that I'd strained my knee or, you know, maybe done too much and just hurt myself. So sent me away and yeah, every day I was dosed up on painkillers and just couldn't really get to the bottom of it. Um, and finally I went to see a family friend who was a physio and he, well, I went to see him a couple of times. Um, on the first session he didn't, he didn't realise what it was. Um, but after a couple of times, it soon became apparent to him that it was something a bit more serious. So he sent me for an MRI scan, which was private and my family paid for that. If I'd have gone through the NHS, there'd have been quite a wait for that. So quite lucky that he pushed us to go for it. Um, I then went for the MRI the next day and found out that, well, my mum got a phone call the following day after that to say that I had bone cancer in my knee. Um, but at this point I didn't know. And yeah, to cut a long story short, mum took me to the doctors uh, for them to explain. Um, but when they told me, I couldn't believe it because I, I didn't have cancer. I never thought I'd have cancer at that age. And I just cried and didn't know really what was going on. But mum and dad found out that I had cancer before I did. So they took me to the hospital for an x-ray and as soon as I went into the hospital my dad's eyes were like red and I thought that's really strange. I was like are you alright your eyes are red and he said oh it must be the light in here but I'd never seen my dad cry in his life and obviously he'd been really upset that day finding out I had cancer. So yeah I just let that go but afterwards I kind of thought back and realised he's probably been upset and crying from finding out the news. When I was diagnosed in the doctors, um, the lady who was diagnosing me, the doctor, I don't think she knew the full extent of my diagnosis, but she sat me down and said, your pain in your knee is cancer. We can either scrape it off um, or you might lose your leg. It was so matter of fact, I might lose a year out of my life, which was like, well, I might just be able to have it scraped off my knee. I might lose my leg. It was all very massive and I thought well massive like two blows in one um yeah so I was very upset I thought I can't imagine living my life without a leg and also I've got cancer like what the hell mm. so then I had so many questions but the doctor couldn't answer them because she was a GP she wasn't a specialist in bone cancer so from there I didn't couldn't have my answers um my questions like answered so we then went down to Birmingham the following week and that's when they could explain to me more about what was going on because they were the specialists. So we did wait a full week from diagnosis to going down to Birmingham because they had to book me in and obviously there was a bit of a wait but it was an awful week because we didn't have the answers. We had to tell family and friends but we didn't really know what was going on. And then when we got down to Birmingham, I knew I was going for a biopsy and this was going to be my first ever operation. I'd never had an operation in my life, so I was preparing myself for that. But then also they were doing more scans down there and it was also like very scary. I remember it just feeling like really dark. Um, and then after that, the nurse took me, and I think it was me and mum and dad, into another room to explain like my treatment options. And there weren't much options really. It was the either have treatment or you don't, but obviously I was going to have the treatment and I didn't realise and I've been trying to search online. It wasn't, you know, you didn't go on your phone and search back then. I was looking on the computer and I didn't know if I was going to have chemotherapy or radiotherapy or if I needed any of it. So when she said I was going to have chemo, that then scared me. And my first thought was, am I going to lose my hair? And I can't live without my hair. And it was all going through my head. But they did say at that point that they were going to try and save my leg and replace the bone with metal. Um, that was going to be a surgery further down the line. But first of all, they wanted to get me back up to Leeds to start my chemo. My chemotherapy started at the end of March. I think it was early April. 
um, first of all I had to have a parter cap fitted which is like a little part inside it, it goes it's down the side of your ribs here and then up and down towards your heart so that was fitted and that was the first trauma because I admit that was my second operation and um, they seemed to make a mistake I think it was the last one on a Friday or something I can't remember and uh, the scars ended up three times as big as what it should be um, but anyway I'm that doesn't bother me now but it was an awful operation I remember it was so painful and then like the day after they fitted that part for my chemo they attached the chemo with this three quarter like inch needle in my side and then they started the chemo so I hadn't even had a chance to settle in this part and then they were starting the chemo and yeah I remember feeling so rough that first time my face like went red and I just I think it's just like your body's never had it before and it's just like the initial reaction to it it's all toxic isn't it so and then I remember seeing other girls and boys around the room like they'd had chemo and they were bald and um, it was really difficult to see them because I thought that's how I'm gonna be I could just see that coming but just had to like carry on I didn't I don't know I think it was so difficult but I just had to deal with it there's no option so yeah I started on the chemo um, and then, yeah, the chemo was horrendous. It was, oh, I was so sick. Just really, yeah, really sick. Lost so much weight. And had to have blood transfusions, platelet transfusions and everything. Because it's having chemotherapy for bone cancer, especially osteosarcoma that I had. It's the most, it's the strongest chemo you can have because it's in your bone. So obviously the treatment was the worst it could be. <laughs> it was yeah really bad and nowadays I might feel sick with a bug or something and I think how did I feel like that for like a year but I did I can't survive a day nowadays <laughs> but I survived a year feeling sick and it was yeah it was horrible so I was in hospital for about a year altogether I was in and out of hospital because it, the cycle that I had was like you were in for a week then you were out for a couple of days then back in and they had to like flush you with fluid before you started your chemo so you were in hospital most of the time but then when I did go home sometimes I got infections and things which brought me back in which I would turn into such a diva because I was like getting my time at home relaxing and then suddenly I'm back in hospital hooked up to antibiotics and I'm back in for however long but um then yeah so after I think it was three or four months they decided that they couldn't save my leg and they couldn't go along with the operation that they planned so to have my bone replaced with metal so they said for best chances of survival I had to have my leg amputated and I remember being called into a, a side room and we'd, we'd planned this appointment and I can't remember what time the appointment was but it was in an afternoon and we sat there and sat there and we kind of knew it would come in but we weren't fully sure and they were when we went into the room there were about eight professionals in there you name it they were in there and we'd waited all afternoon and we'd spoke to other people come and gone and I think they were waiting to tell us this news and um or waiting for everyone to get there so my surgeon from Birmingham actually came up and was in the room explaining it physios nurses whatever and um when they told me I just thought no I can't have my leg amputated like no I don't want it um I just thought surely there's another option it's 2012 like we're not in the 1900s anymore or 1800s like surely there's something um but obviously there wasn't anything and for me to survive that was the only option so obviously I wanted to live so I thought I'm gonna have to go with it but my nurses did have to talk me around because it was a hard thing to be told especially at such a young age um I think my nurse took me into another room and I think mum and dad were about but I can't even remember I remember going into like the bay which is on the day unit bit which is where you used to have all your appointments and laying on this bed and it's like you can see a view of Leeds it's right nice and then you've got all this bad news that you're trying to swallow and the nurses I think came up to me and you know trying to talk me around a bit and maybe explain it I was a bit more comfortable with them so they could like explain it a bit better trying to get my head around it I think mum and dad thought well we're happy to we wanted to have it done we wanted to survive but I think when it's your own body it's like it's the worst it's just it's, you can't explain it
I can't actually remember the day that they told me, like the date. Um, but I know that I think it was, I want to guess like around two weeks after or even less. Like it might have been a Monday and they were like a week, like next Thursday you're having your amputation. So they were like, right, you're going to have to have another round of chemotherapy first, which was sick. And then we're going to send you down to Birmingham. So I remember going home and then obviously the day came and I was like, I can't go. Just didn't want to go. I remember having my last shower at home and taking a picture of like my two legs stood there. And when I look back, that picture of my legs is so skinny. So obviously I was really sick, like really the chemotherapy had really taken its toll at this point. And yeah, I think that day, I'd, yeah, I just didn't want to go. My dad didn't want to go. My dad didn't want to take me. My mum didn't want to take me, but they had to do because they wanted me to live. So that we had to go. So I think we had turned up really late. I think we nearly missed the appointment to be fair. Um, but yeah, I really didn't want to go. But my nurse actually reminded me, well, reminded me, we spoke about it not too long ago. She said that I'd like text her on that day being really quite upset and like, why do I need to have the, you know, quite, probably I was angry, I was upset. I was, I don't want to say I was blaming her, but I was like thinking at that age, I was thinking that she was telling me to have it done when I didn't want it done. Um, but it was just how I was feeling at the time. I didn't know who to turn to really. And then, um, yeah, so that, that night actually we stayed in a Premier Inn um, and we took some more pictures of me and my legs, which is crazy. Like that's so, oh, I took some pictures, but it's like the last time with, with my legs, which is mad to think. But the day after um, in the morning, um, I think I asked to stay at the Premier Inn because I didn't want to stay in the hospital the night before. And they said, well, yeah, so, as long as you come in at like six in the morning. So we did. And then I remember them coming and writing like a big arrow on the leg because that's the right leg to amputate, obviously. If it wasn't one, that would be terrible. So, and then in the meantime, I've painted my toenails, even though they told me, no, no, nail, nail varnish, but every toenail I painted a different colour. So I thought, why not? It's the last time I'll ever be seeing that leg again. And I then had to walk from like this room to like the bed, and that was like the last time I walked. But from the time of diagnosis, they wanted me to use crutches, but I don't think I used crutches at that point. I wanted to walk for the last time. But like, like I said, like two years after, I remember, because I remember when I used to go see Alan, and I, I'd be like, oh, I just, I can't, I couldn't get out of my head. Like, I was just, didn't want this life. I wanted my old life. Like, I can't, couldn't have it. So it's such a massive process. And when people say, how did you cope? It's like so many words you can't even, you know, like them years that you go through, you come through such a journey because you, you change so much yeah. and you can't put it into words like what you go through, but you just do. So yeah. yeah, I think the first few years were just gradual. I think you just learn to live with it kind of, you kind of have to, but you kind of get your head around it and just carry on trying to do simple daily stuff so you get through it. But then definitely when I, got my leg out that was massive um i don't think like you can ever get over it because what it's not normal is it? it's not natural it's not what happens to people really generally i think i'll it's always gonna be i'm like this forever yeah. Yeah. right because i think because i get on with i wear my leg and i get on with it if i didn't have this leg then I would definitely feel more disabled. Like when I don't, in the morning when I get up, I get used to hopping to the toilet. That's not what a normal person does. But you just do it. Yeah. And you think it's normal, but it's not. That definitely, because my mum says, and I don't mean to do it on my Instagram, I don't mean to paint this picture of this amazing life because that's not reality for anyone. But it does paint that picture, but I don't want it to always paint that picture, which is hard. Um. And like, I'll go to the shop and get on with it, but people don't realise how hard it is because I just do it. Don't, I mean, sometimes I moan because it's bloody annoying. I don't always moan about it. I just do it. Yeah. And then people think, you know, I mean, Phil would tell you different because I'll go and walk with him and I don't show up more because I'm wearing my leg. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah it's, it's very weird. I think coming to terms with having cancer, but then coming to terms also at the same time with you becoming disabled because of the cancer is another 
whole thing to deal with. I think I'll always think I want I want my leg back, I want that life back, but then I always think I've done so many amazing things and so much stuff that I feel like part of it's all, you know, might be negative, but then I do feel, I always think I feel richer, like I feel like I've got much more of an understanding of life and I feel like deeper as a person than what I would have been. I suppose now life's quite different to what I expected it to be when I was younger. I never thought for a start obviously I'd have cancer, so that changed my life completely. Not only because I had cancer, but because of my amputation, so my life is very different. And I think it, it is potentially more difficult than what I make out because I do have, you know, really good times and everything. And I think my Instagram shows that. Um, but I don't always show the other side of things, really. Um, so, for example, the other week I went to a festival, I put some pictures on, and it was great. I loved it. But a few hours later, when we had to walk home at midnight, I was in agony. I had to walk a mile home and I was just struggling all the way home. It was so difficult and I just walked and I just didn't stop because I knew I had to get back I was in so much pain. So I think people don't see that side to, to me and I, I would like to show that more on my Instagram, I think, but the other side of things, I have done so much and I've had so many opportunities that I would never have done if I hadn't had cancer. Um, so, yeah from basically now I work with the charity which I love doing and yeah I've done that for a few years now um, from doing my talks in schools to when I was giving out the grants to the young people I've really enjoyed that and that's something I would never have done if I hadn't been poorly and something I've felt has like made my life richer because I've done something that's like helped other people which I've really loved doing um, as well as that, I now do. I've been doing modelling for a few years, which I really enjoy doing as well. Um, I've worked, done shoots for River Island. Um, I'm in talks with another company at the minute, which is exciting. I just fingers crossed that I get that. Um, it's not all the time though. It might be once or twice a month, but when I do it, I really enjoy it, and that's something I would never have dreamt of doing before. And I do really enjoy it. Um, but the not so glamorous part of my life. I uh, I work in the my family shop two or three times a week, which also people don't see that side of my life. Like that's quite stressful and it's quite challenging on my leg and um, yeah, quite testing for me. But I like to do that. I like to probably keep some normality in my life. So um, I do enjoy doing that and working with my family. So I've got a real mixture of things going on. And then obviously I met Phil four and a half years ago now on first dates, which I think people think, oh, she lives this lifestyle, but it's literally now I'm working in the shop. I'm, you know, doing other bits and bobs that people don't really see. They think my life's just this amazing picture, but you know, it's not easy at times and I do find it difficult, but yeah, I try, I try my best and try my best to enjoy it as much as I can really.